This one? Good morning, everybody. We were just asked to wait five minutes, which means another two or three, and then we start. And today we shall make it like that, that uh, everybody gets maximum eight minutes to talk from the panel, and I shall stop the person who is talking further. So please excuse the panelists. You will be interrupted. And then we have half an hour for a discussion. So prepare yourself to, you know, to contribute. Do you agree with that? Is yes. half an hour enough? Super. So we were making this management already. Yes. Thank you. We need just to manage the time. I understood that somebody very important is coming. That's why we wait, no? <laughs> And Chinese, uh, very important people. Ambassador, ambassador, we are waiting. Is ambassador coming? So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. I'm going to speak Russian, uh, although I could switch into English, but uh, this is a bilingual session, uh, therefore uh, we can use both languages. Uh, welcome to everyone at this uh, session on uh, dynamic societies. And I uh, do hope uh, that uh, we are going to uh, stick uh, to the plan. I uh, do rely uh, on Danica. Therefore, uh, let's uh, start. We are going to have a very interesting uh, discussion. And I would uh, encourage everyone uh, on the panel uh, this morning uh, to uh, take a look at uh, uh, several things, not just at the general uh, issues uh, that we have been uh, talking about uh, for years. Let us focus today on things uh, that uh, have uh, happened uh, over the last year. Uh, we have had uh, the last forum uh, exactly a year ago, and we had an identical session. So let's uh, throw a look at what has happened in our dynamic uh, societies uh, since that time. Let's do that. Now I'm going to pass the floor to Danica now, and uh, uh, she is going to introduce the panelists. Thank you very much, Natalia. have an effective panel, uh, everybody talking eight minutes and then having time for discussion. Uh, we also don't like too much the slides, but you know, I prepared one with a map, so I shall show it to you. Sorry. It's good if you are close here, you know. <coughs> Dan, it's a pork. I just tried it out, so. Should be on. It was already on the first one. This is not here. And my name is Dan, it's a pork. I'm sorry. I shall just start while she is preparing this. Yeah, that it is. That's the one. You know, we tried out everything, so uh, I don't know why it's now, now not functioning. This is my presentation. <coughs> yes. This one? No. no, this one, where it's written down, it's a pork. Right? The, uh, no. Tambila. Tambila. You 
I hate this. Okay, I shall start. After 45, it looked like the world, its geographic and political construction, found its long-lasting uh, form. A limited number of the world powers, you will have to help because she, this lady does not, she, my name was here. Uh, I really hate that, you know, because I tried out everything before. It's bef before that. It was here. Yes. Yeah. Here we go. That. Here we go. And which one? No. Not yeah, one of these not, two? Uh, yeah, no, 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 this. Not this one either. No. This was yesterday. Yeah. And this one is to later in the afternoon. So. No map, I, I just start. So what I said is that after 45, we were looking, can you stop now? I, I'm, I have enough, thank you. I have enough. So it looked that the world is geographic and political construction found its long lasting form. A limited number of world powers and a larger group of the satellite states from all continents. Now we know that this period of the Cold War was frozen silence before the storm. About 60 years later, nothing is anymore as it was. Our world is in reconstruction. What looks strong seems to me much weaker and the opposite. The power center of the world is shifting. Traditional political structure and institutions are losing their credibility as such and as ideal world models. In our efforts of globalization, we discovered the limit, limited value of regional and national solutions. Still today, not everybody understands that the label better or superior has to be replaced by different. And that power has to be replaced by the responsibility. One can have the impression that in some sense, we are moving back to the old paradigm based on concept such as superiority and power. In business, we have learned that this does not help to be successful. I personally believe that the actual storm that I mentioned before of processes of disintegration and reintegration offers us new opportunities. It appears that the new US leadership will return to the sometimes neglected all American focus. This will give Europe an opportunity to reconsider its position towards its continental neighbors, Russia and China. Businesses and business schools can play an important role in restoring and strengthening relations. The ancient Silk Road and its roots, and this is what I wanted to show you because I made a nice picture about this Silk Road, a network that for centuries promoted trade and cultural interaction through regions of the Asian continent, connecting the East and West from China to the Mediterranean Sea, creating long distance political and economic relations between the civilizations of regions and nations. The new Silk Road and the related Obor, One Belt, One Road initiative can have the same great impact. Business and business schools can have an important role in restoring trust in, at this moment, heavily disordered and disoriented world. The new leadership and management paradigm will contain at least the following notions. Discovering and listening instead of showing and preaching. Enjoying differences instead of enforcing assimilation in order to enrich each other's culture and practices. Perhaps we succeed on a higher abstract level to develop a paradigm that fits us all. In my opinion, business schools have to, be base, to be, have to base their activities on a variety of practical paradigms in order to play their important role as educators, intermediators, and business society platforms. And since Natalia suggested that each of us is telling something what we did from last year to this year, I have to say that we were in Siemen, which I am president of, the association of 220 business schools from 55 countries. We were firstly receiving or welcoming the first Chinese business school in Siemen. 
because we started Siemens is Central and East European Management Development Association, and now we call it Association of the Management Development in Dynamic Societies. And you will be interested in from where this word, at least in my, uh, what I remember is, that six, seven years ago, we were at AMBA meeting, and AMBA, you don't know, Andrew, this, but at AMBA meeting in, in uh, Dubai, and we were talking about how we should do, uh, you know, it was kind of retreat, and we were talking how to make, uh, how to make management education more relevant and so on. And then we, uh, and how to make it more adjusted to the emerging economies. And we said we don't like the word emerging economies because emerging economies, some are emerged, some will emerge soon, et cetera, et cetera. So we came to the, and I think it was a South African guy, Nick Benedel, Benedel who said dynamic societies. And then we took it over, and then we gave later, after some discussions, to Siemen the name dynamic society because we, we are, in fact, all the time focusing on this uh, type of countries, how to help and to support these countries. So what did we do? We were, as I said, receiving the first uh, school, one of the very good management schools in China, Zhejiang University School of Management in Hangzhou. We are having the first Siemen conference in China, end of September next year, I mean this year, and it will be in Hangzhou and in Chengdu. We are having the, um, uh, so we shall have pre-conference event in Chengdu and then the conference in Hangzhou. Then uh, we, were, uh, we are now uh, preparing the first Silk Road MBA where we shall for now have five countries in, you know, from China, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Lithuania, Poland, Lithuania, and Slovenia, where I come from, but this is just the start. We shall probably have more schools in, I mean probably for sure, if they show the interest. So if you have an interest, please let me know because this month we shall, at the end of this month, we shall formalize everything. So I thank you very much and uh, we shall give the floor yes, to yes. my colleague now. Thank you very much, Danica. Uh, Danica is a head uh, of the panel and a co-moderator. Uh, Danica, in her presentation, has uh, mentioned uh, our, our colleagues from China, so it makes very good sense uh, to pass the floor uh, to uh, Justin Yufulin, Yufulin uh, who uh, comes from China. Over to you, sir. It's an honor to participate in this panel and to provide some of my observations and thinkings about how to make business school education productive, contribute to the development of each country in Euro-Asia, and also to promote the economic integration across country in Euro-Asia. As Danica mentioned in, his, in, in her interventions, after the ending of the Cold War, the economic relation is the most important relation among countries. And uh, business schools in every country in general attract the best, brightest students. So if we can offer good education with a good model to them, certainly there will be a driving force for the development in their own countries and contribute to the prosperity of other countries as well. And uh, when we talk about the Euro-Asian integration and hope the business education can contribute to that, we need to understand the most important challenges in the Euro-Asia is diversity because Country in Eurasia, they are different. Some uh, large countries, like my own, but some are very small. And some are high income country, like those countries in Europe, and uh, others are in the middle income or even low income. And some uh, advanced industrialized societies, but some of them are still in the early stage of development 
rely on natural resources and agriculture as the main activities in economic life. And also in the Euro-Asia, some are still on the process of transition to a well-developed market economies, and uh, others, they are advanced market economies. So with these diversities, certainly it provides opportunities, but also challenges. And the main challenges for me as a teacher is that most business school, there are too much influence by the models in the US, or to some extent, also by some business school in the well-developed European countries. And the theory that we taught in the business school in general are from the textbooks that used in the US or in the advanced country in Europe. But theory will be applicable if the conditions are the same. But we know, as I mentioned, the diversities of Euro-Asian countries. So very often, those theories look very sexy, but when we try to apply the theory to the realities in the world, then both the professors, the professions, and the students are going to be frustrated. So with this, if we want to make a business education contribute to the career of the students. On the one hand, I think the faculty members of the business school in Eurasia has a responsibility to come up with some new theories based on their own country's experiences. And then those kind of theory will be more helpful for helping, for helping the students to understand the challenges and opportunities. That's on the one hand. But on the other hand, because we are talking about Euro-Asian integration, that means we want the students not only to explore the opportunity within their own country, but we also want to encourage the students to grasp the opportunity that come up from the integration of the country in Euro-Asia. By that, I think the students not only need to study the theories, the practice that might be useful for them to deal with their own country's situation. We also need to encourage the student with the ability to work with others in different countries. And for that, I think it's very important to cultivate the ability of appreciating other countries' culture, other countries' political system, other countries' society. Those kind of appreciation would be the foundation for them to work with other and the business partner in other country. And uh, they also need to be flexible because one practice may be workable in one society but may not be workable in other society with different cultural, legal, or political system. And so flexibility would also be important criterion for good business students. And the so one is teamwork. No one can you know, conquer the world by himself. No one can benefit from the opportunity by oneself. And especially if you want to work with, in other society, you will also have to be able to work with other people in a team, not only members from your own country, but also members from other country. And I think that if we can encourage this kind of flexibility, ability to you know, appreciate uh, other cultures and to work with other people, those kind of general ability may be more important than some set of knowledge that can be implemented, can be applied immediately. So let me stop here. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you very much. I have to say I was always um, a little bit disturbed seeing China developing only in the sense the, of the, you know, in the direction of American business schools. And I think that by this, uh, what you said, and by the, uh, by the Silk Road and the focus on this part of the world, also, also on this part of the world, is something really uh, very welcome. And I'm very proud of you. And Professor comes from Peking University, which is considered in China the number one. 
Uh, now I would like to go from uh, China to Kazakhstan uh, on the Silk Road, and uh, I suggest that president of, uh, of uh, Almaty Management University, Alma Yu, Azilbek Kozakhmetov, uh, has a floor. Have a, will have a floor. Good morning. Thank you very much for giving the floor for me. But as I know, it was a two representative from Kazakhstan, Danica, and second representative of Kazakhstan gave his time to me. That means I have 16 minutes. <laughs> it's a job. I know. <laughs> uh, okay, we are speaking about. Uh, dynamically developing societies. Uh, when we are speaking about dynamics, that means we should compare what was in the past, what is now. Uh, past was 20th century, main port, important things was energy consumption, GDP, and quality of life. Now in 21st, it's uh, information, knowledge, media products, computer programming, and so on. There is a lot of differences. But anyway, Peter Senge told that only sustainable competitive advantage is your organization's ability to learn faster than the competition. And paradigm, paradigm of the con competition is changed. Now it's a fast eat slow, not a large eat small. And uh, I look at uh, how we can uh, def define what is a dynamic society. I look at through the all uh, main uh, uh, classifications. There is a, some by GNI classifications. I found the fourth group. It's okay for us. It's an uh, uh, average uh, 4,000 and 12,000 uh, dollars. Then I look through human development indexes, knowledge economy indexes, global innovation indexes, index of globalizations. And uh, up, I, what is uh, interesting, I found some group of countries which are very good in all these uh, which, which is a good correlation between some uh, statistics. And the, you see there are about 24 countries, which of course not certainly 24, it can be 30. But I, I found that we have the core of countries which we can call as a dynamic countries. But dynamic countries in dynamic society, it's not the same. Uh, dynamic societies, it's a society it's a, in the process of constant change. I'm giving the, some of my criteria to define dynamic societies. Of course, maybe you can, will, will you give uh, another one, another one, once. Change, people attitudes, institutions, permanent state of turbulence is accepted. And uh, change, even constant change in legal environments. Not one constitution for 200 years. Uh, cultural environments, assertiveness, high degree of perception of uh, it's not uncertainty avoidance, strategic thinking, entrepreneurial attitude, innovativeness, out of the box thinking, uh, desire to constantly learn and self cultivate, flexibility of mind. Uh, educational environment as well is good in uh, dynamic societies, high expenses on education. In Russia, special program 5 to 100. Uh, about leading universities. China, a lot of programs, especially 21-1. Kazakhstan, Bolashak program, who is, which is uh, giving money for all people who would like to uh, get education outside. Brazil, and of course, innovation development system in the countries, like Russia, Kazakhstan, Brazil, and China. Uh, there is an uh, advantage of dynamic societies. In order to be, advan to be dynamic societies, you should be innovative should have innovation management, entrepreneurial thinking, knowledge management, which is not uh, really uh, often mentioned in, in our conferences. For me, it's in the knowledge management, uh, system of knowledge management, it's a good uh, source to increase productivity of our in management systems and uh, productivity systems. Constant management development, creativity and interdisciplinary approach, 
development the promotion of which we every, everybody is telling but physical intelligence there not enough level of uh, uh, for people uh, in, in our countries it's not only the le bad level of health care system it's a bad level of our uh, conscious self-conscious upgrade of culture not a rejection developing identity keeping up the value of learning innovation as a basis for research and new competence not only knowledge and skills but in personal development of course big data and business analytics and of course new management requires new values man of wars works for mankind it's ibrahim kunalbaev kazakh philosopher we uh, established special principle in our university win 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 even in each case if we have cooperation between two sides which we need win win every time not existing member of this deal uh, it's a society should be interested should be implemented should be get, get in account and uh, challenges of business education in Eurasian space uh, which, which is uh, already mentioned some part but anyway we have low level of business schools in regional universities, low level of research, insufficient internationalization, uh, low evidence of international accreditations and professional ranking, uh, low number of practitioners and teaching in English among faculty, lack of usage of case studies of local companies, we using American, as I already told, low entry requirements per selection, and most business schools it's in capital cities. But uh, what uh, it's about Eurasia, but we have a new Silk Road as well. New Silk Road, if you look, it's already covering like Eurasian region. And uh, that means uh, we have to establish special program how to incorporate Silk Road values, Silk Road uh, aims in order to get synergy. Uh, we have already University Alliance on Silk Road, but we have to establish uh, uh, business education alliance on Silk Road. Of course, it should be on the base of CIMAN. And we need a Silk Road Center for global knowledge, academic cooperation, think tank, international events and projects, study research on Silk Road, joint projects, study and publications. Under these points, it will be good um, scientific uh, base for uh, dynamic societies. Uh, we, everybody knows triple helix of Itzkovich, but we need uh, now not just only triple helix, which is a uh, state, universities and business. Society should be part of the dynamic societies, because we are speaking about societies and not about economies. How to make competition fairer? It's already told that uh, for fairer selection, we have to have the same exams, like Jamat, like... Uh, TOEFL, no, it's in TOEFL, maybe a good, a bad example. Uh, of course not, but what, 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 what we should do? How fair it is for, for universities? We have uh, such examples, like L2, we should be Elephant, or Gazelle, or Mouse. It, we cannot establish the same exams for that three animals. Do all need to climb that three Equis, double ACSB, AMBA. Or we need accreditation for dynamic societies. It can be like international quality accreditation, but to ne next level of accreditation. That's all. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Solbeck. Please stay at the podium. A very interesting, great presentation. My question to you. What happened over the past year globally in Kazakhstan and in the world? And your particular school where you're the president. Just a few points, please. I thought we were supposed to talk about dynamic countries, and you want me to talk about Kazakhstan. I thought I should avoid speaking about Kazakhstan, should be speaking about global matters. Okay.
My university, this past year, we opened the School of Engineering Management. First students have been enrolled. We're moving into that direction. We've uh, established a creativity zone for students. It's 600 square meters where the students go for their startup projects. We have a, a management school, but this startup movement, uh, entrepreneurial skills is something which is very important to uh, change the contents of learning. Doesn't mean we're going to be behind in research. It simply means we need more applied research. In that case, uh, in that sense, all our educational system is changing. While well, the knowledge and skills, of course, are important and all universities are going to focus on that. But we would want to also focus on the personalities of our students. We want to promote those personalities, to help them uh, be prepared for the rest of their uh, lives. These are, this is the main news, uh, something that happened in our university. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next presentation, uh, I would like to ask our old friend, old not in age, but in, uh, in the length of our friendship, Virginius Cantodus, Dean of uh, Andesis Business School and President of the Baltic Association of Management. Thank you, Natalia. And, uh, and Natalia probably did not, you know, she like make a joke, but it's really, I'm counted, it's not so young anymore, you know, I counted what I'm already in management education for 27 years, and uh, yes. uh, most of my time I've been spending in dynamic, uh, uh, dynamically developing societies, uh, Lithuania, Baltic countries, and last nine years I moved uh, to more mature society to United States, and I'm a dean of a, a small private business school down there. So, and also uh, the last seven years, I've been working with the, the management consulting, working with a practical and concrete business. So I can compare dynamically developing societies and more mature societies for sure. And what I can say uh, from my perspective, what I see uh, the main differences in dynamically developing societies. And yesterday when I came to the panel, I just managed to hear the last speaker. So the last speaker also pointing out, uh, he'd been uh, talking from a Russian business perspective. He'd been saying, you know, that uh, dynamically developing societies, they, uh, first of all, what the difference from others? But, you know, they don't need just general education. They need uh, decisions. They need decisions. They need solutions, you know, how to solve the particular problems. And they need to do that effectively. They need to do that efficiently and now. And uh, they also understand that very well, but, uh, you know, it's not enough even if you have a great leadership in the company. It's not enough to have just leadership, but it's not enough to do that on your own. You need to involve people. In, into the decision making and in the problem solving. So when you need to involve people, you need to empower them. And the challenge is how to do that, how to empower them, what they would be able to solve the problems together fast, efficiently, and effectively. And uh, then I see uh, what kind of the, these demands bringing for the business schools. I wanted you know, to make three remarks in terms of the content, in terms of the forms and methods, and in terms of the quality of the faculty. So first of all, then we talk about the content. Uh, I see that it's definitely not enough just to teach functional areas in the management, in business, in management, uh, marketing strategy, finance, etc. So as we discuss, you know, we need a problem solving skills. So in order, you know, to solve these problems and not by individual, we need first of all to teach how to work as a team, how to compose first of all good team, and when I say good team. I mean complementary team. What does it mean complementary team? It's different. People are different in way of thinking, in different of perceptions. Then we talk on the global scale, and our colleague from China also mentioned that, you know, we come into the intercultural uh, surrounding. We need to talk about the also multicultural teams. So that's a big challenge when we have a multicultural teams or we have a different teams even inside of that particular country, we for sure, we would have a conflict. 
for sure. That's predictable in advance. So it means that in the schools, in the content, we need to teach how to solve conflicts. So not to stop them. That's one of the biggest mistakes that sometimes psychology has been doing. They say, okay, try to avoid the conflicts. No. If you want to really solve a problem, you need to accelerate a conflict sometimes, but you need to be sure that this conflict is not destructive but constructive. And how to turn destructive conflict into constructive? You need a number of things. First of all, you need to understand people in your organization or in your, let's say, team, if you're talking about the multicultural teams. So it means you need to understand how do they talk, how do they perceive information. We are different not only in terms of the multicultural aspects, but also inside of the national context. We have different styles, perceptions, some are very fast, some are more slow, some like you know, more exact things, some more you know, general things. So we need to understand what kind of team do we have, we need to compose the team, and we need to know how to talk with each individual differently. Also, we need to know how to handle you know, the meetings when we all these different people coming together with different needs and perceptions and ways of their understanding of life so how many schools are teaching how to manage a meetings it takes for granted but we come together and we do that it's, it does not work like that there are certain skills at the Jesus graduate school we paying a lot of attention how to manage a meeting. It's a special skill, it's special competence. How to do that, in which way, what kind of rules should be created in advance, how you need to do that. So these are the important things. It should be on the school curriculum. Also, you know, uh, how do you help you know, your people in the organization to understand the strategy? Uh, not, you know, complicated ways of creating strategy which only top managers could understand, but how to do that in a simple way, we call that mission action plan, but everybody in the organization would be involved in developing that and understand where organization is moving, which direction, in general terms, you know, what, we, what kind of values we've been using and living these values, not only talking these values. And also, how to structure the organization, how to structure your company or your team in such a way that it would follow that mission plan. So very rarely we're talking about the structures, how to build that based on where you would like to do, what uh, your company is about. So, and this content-wise, it needs to be switched in my opinion. In terms of forms of learning and methods, it should be hands-on learning. It's not just enough to give the speeches or, or, or lecturing, etc. You need to practice together. You need to discuss these things together with your students, with your managers together. It should be interactive, discussion-based, and that, of course, turns you into a lot of unknown areas. So uh, a lot of, you know, you need to be taking risk of failure because you don't know what you would find that. And, and if we are not ready to say, I don't know to our students, but I could find out, that could be a challenge. And that brings us to demands to the faculty. And faculty members, they're supposed to be more consultants than just academicians. They need to really understand in depth, you know, what the business is about. It means they need to work with businesses. And also, they need to do research, which is relevant more than just, you know, uh, based on the academic interest. So we need to speak, and uh, as Ulbeck mentioned, that innovative research. So what this research could bring to the organizations, to the companies. So that's important thing to do. And uh, what challenges actually brings all these demands? So first of all, content-wise. We all understand what we, especially state organizations, we are framed by the uh, regulations of the state. You cannot do that, you cannot do that in the content. So that's where the state role comes into the, into the game very importantly, because if they would frame us very heavily, we would not be able to change that content, we would not be able to follow the demands from the market. That's a challenge. The same about the forms of teaching and learning. So if we would not be let it flexibility in different forms of learning, we are stuck. The same about faculty. You know, if we would like to do innovative research, consulting, etc., what shall we do? Uh, if we would not be able to yes. publish in these journals what are needed you know, for your academic career. So all these challenges, I think these are the biggest challenge from the state and where, that's where cooperation from the state and from society is definitely needed in order to do that. So 
uh, we thought about is, we thought about want. Should we do that? That's up to us. So we need to involve not only business community in order to have our dynamic societies, but also the government, our officials. And so then uh, we would be able to do something. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are nicely keeping eight minutes, so this is great. And now I would, uh, I would like to give the floor to Andrew Wilson, the CEO of AMBA International. And let me, allow me to say two words about uh, AMBA. Uh, I, as a president of uh, Seaman, I was uh, facing all these uh, 23 years of existence of Seaman, uh, different, uh, different uh, attitudes to our association from other international associations. And I have to say that AMBA was the first one who was really understanding that there is a need for, uh, for uh, an association uh, of management schools from this part of the world. Mm -hmm. And AMBA was the first one who was really, without prejudices, coming to Russia to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to review the Russian MBAs and to uh, credit them. So my big compliments and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very years. much, Denise. Thank and it's 50 this, years this, they celebrate this, now, so we are congratulating them yeah. with a hand of applause. Now. On my behalf, uh, surely AMBA uh, celebrates uh, 50th anniversary this year, and it's a very solemn occasion for us, and very happy to note that at the start of this big race, uh, AMBA starts here in Russia. Tomorrow, there's going to be a special session from AMBA devoted to the 50 years of the association. Phones at the desk, but I, I hope that was something she nice. She was talking about Thank your 50th anniversary. I told you, I told about your 50th uh, right, anniversary exactly. that you started to celebrate it in, okay. from Moscow, from Splendid. this Gaidar Forum, and that yesterday will be the special session for AMBA. Tomorrow. Uh, to, tomorrow, to, to, tomorrow. Sorry, tomorrow yeah. will be the special session. No, to just some 50 let us after special session. AMBA is 50 years old this year, and we've got a year long program of celebrations, but it started, our very first events are here in Moscow this week. Um, and we're very proud we accredited our first school in Russia 25 years ago. So um, already there's great maturity um, in the Russian uh, market. We accredit 246 schools and we have 23,000 student and graduate members. And I think just the first thing I would say, and I'm acutely aware of the eight minutes, which I'm going to stick to, is, um, even week by week, this is becoming a more global world. And I see, I do a lot of journalist interviews. I did one with the Financial Times last week, where they said, how do you solve this conflict of countries not wanting to teach the best Western Europe and American business practice for MBAs, because it's not relevant locally. And I say, I genuinely believe this. Far too much conflict is invented around this issue. It's really very, very simple. Any business school in any of our 70 countries where we accredit schools wants the best of both worlds, which is the best of global practice and techniques, of course, and the best of local relevant management experience and management teaching. It's very simple. You do want the best of both worlds. So, so how do you create that? Well, one of the, the, the most logical things is to create alliances worldwide with other business schools. So you're taking the richness of that practice globally. Um, and I'm a great believer that at the very least you should want as a school six business partnerships with a very similar school to your own standards in each of the six continents. And if you just start with that, with faculty exchange, program creation, joint marketing, student exchange, you're off to a great start. One thing I do find, though, in this rush to, to build um, uh, Eurasian and global programs is people are choosing far too many partners. And, and I keep a record when I go to schools of who's got the most partners. And the record at the moment is a Chinese school I won't name, but they proudly tell me they have 67 different partnerships with other schools around the world. And of course, that is absolutely impossible to manage. And, and we do strongly recommend you have far fewer, because really all that is doing is collecting business cards and names. But you can't create meaningful alliances with, with that many partners. 
Um, this, is, this is our Russian network, um, and this is our Indian network, which is growing very fast. So in this whole Eurasian area, uh, do look out for the Indian schools and this year growth. Um, most of those Indian graduates have found it harder to get into their schools than any other students in any other countries in the world. At our best Indian schools, they accept one in 100 applicants. So these are high flyers, but they will nearly all work in India. So I was in India before Christmas, and I find that those programs are teaching the best of Indian best practice. Uh, the, there's no, well, we don't want to teach Western philosophy of business here. They're teaching what it needs to run dynamic companies in India, um, and extremely impressive too. Uh, if I look at China now, where we accredit 30 schools, two big things that have changed this year is, is the drive for higher and higher standards in Chinese schools and to develop entrepreneurs. And I was very honored to be at Peking University in September, where I had a personal audience with the president of Peking University. And he took me into their new entrepreneurs center, where at the government's request, they've built a new entrepreneur center on that campus. And it, I'd say it's adva in advance of anything that's happening in most of the best European schools. Uh, and the irony is, where you think central government might be slow to change things, the rate of innovation is far quicker now in China because everything is centrally driven and controlled. So you can bring in change. And I actually think you'll find much of the entrepreneurial development in the whole Eurasian area will come from China because it's certainly moving much faster um, than many of the European schools that I see. The other change, too, to look out for is the government's change there to move away from research orientation at business schools into creating more entrepreneurial programs. And that's been carefully monitored by the government over the next few years. They want to see faculty with more entrepreneurial skills because it's to create employment. And we sometimes forget that much of the drive in business schools is to support the economy creating more jobs. Uh, the same thing's happening in Germany, the same thing's happening in Italy because the large companies are no longer providing enough jobs to employ all the graduates. And if you're going to create local entrepreneurial programs, you do need partners around the world, but a small entrepreneur creating jobs in a Chinese city is not going to be interested in large American or European case studies because they're probably not going to be um, so relevant. Just one thing I would touch on here that we're trying to do to further some of this cooperation is for schools clearly not good enough to get the top level accreditation, be it AMBER or AACSB, we've started something called the AMBER Development Network, which is to bring other countries into the global family, both in Eurasia and further afield. Um, and these have become members of AMBA, where we're supporting them with much more basic improvements of their business school activities and introducing schools in, in Mauritius, in Zimbabwe, in Senegal, in Bangladesh to the rest of the network. Again, to enrich culturally uh, the experience and sharing of programs and students. Um, satisfaction of students is, is very high at the moment amongst our schools, and, but they are saying they want more and more global connections, both to have a semester at an overseas school, but also to have a network when they leave of other like-minded global MBAs and students. Um, I would say, too, that the value of these global networks is not immediately obvious. You don't want just a great American school, a great Chinese school, a great European school. And I, I, I've quoted at the Seaman Conference um, three areas of cooperation of similar problems where students would like to see students from these other countries, which are not so immediately obvious. So two years ago in Russia, when the oil price collapsed and there were some trade embargoes, some of the top um, Russian CEOs were saying to a couple of our schools, the MBAs can't handle currency collapse, oil price collapse, and trade embargoes. They don't know how to handle them. Well, all those three things were happening, and our Venezuelan school, which is highly respected, was dealing with the same things natural cooperation there. Kazakhstan and Australia, some of our schools are in remote areas, 
1,500 miles from the nearest city. So how do you share some of those experiences? And in the Ukraine and Lebanon, our schools have spoken because, again, they've had some similar market conditions. So not immediately obvious, but look for partnerships and idea sharing in countries with similar problems. Um, and this, Jeff, very, very finally, I, I mentioned this yesterday, as digital learning now through technology and teaching is really starting to come of age, uh, this 45 square meter wall that can bring in up to 80 students at once that IE have created, is this a way forward that really will facilitate more and more um, global and pan-Eurasian networking of both faculty as well as students. I think that's probably eight minutes, and I don't want Denise telling me I've got Thank you so that. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. So. <clears throat> Uh -huh. I'd like to give the floor to the next speaker, also our old-time friend, Vesilin Blagoyev, who is now Vice Rector of the International University College in Bulgaria. Before, he was high in the government of uh, Bulgaria. Uh, um, General Secretary of the Cabinet of Ministry <laughs> and um, of the uh, agency, privatization agency in <laughs> Bulgaria. And he was member of the board of Simon board for a number of years. So, and Vesselin, as he's preparing his presentation, was one of the, uh, was the author, one of the first marketing manuals. I was asked to, to talk about something which is a little bit far away from uh, the mainstream, uh, from the conceptual things. Uh, of course, the conceptual things are the most important things because they uh, represent our vision, mission, uh, all these things uh, which we have to decide on our side as uh, top managers of the schools, business schools. I'll talk about the little things, the technologies and how they affect our uh, education and things uh, we do. Uh, first of all, there are inevitable things which are happening whether we like them or not. For example, this is just one little example, uh, some five, six months ago in Singapore they presented emotionally intelligent robot. Can you imagine that this thing is becoming more and more real? If we take it uh, on the line of the main avenues which we uh, see, we have the artificial intelligence developing, uh, coming to self-educating robots. Uh, it sounds dangerous to me, but anyway, this is one of the things which is happening. Then the ITization of the process, we are stuffing anything which we do, uh, coming up to the managerial process uh, with IT, uh, uh, equipment and uh, uh, software and programs and all the rest, which again seems to be a little bit uh, frightening. Imagine that uh, instead of a medical doctor, you have a robot uh, which tells what you have actually there uh, without anything which uh, previously we were considering to be a good medical uh, study of the patient. Then we have this Googleization which is a terrible thing, which uh, uh, I'll talk a few uh, minutes later about this again, which leads the people actually to getting away from the normal analytical uh, process in the education and further in their activities. Then we have video conferencing, which is again a mainstream, and video recorded classes. Uh, if we take uh, this on the side of the education, the Googleization actually affects uh, in the most terrible way, I would say, the learning process. Because the people, the students first of all, but also some of us, uh, take to get the things as for granted, you know. You just press the button and you get the answer. No need of uh, analysis, no need of survey previously, no need of uh, coming up with uh, uh, complex uh, considerations and solutions. Then the learning tends to be substituted more and more in the minds of the uh, uh, students 
with getting the result, which is wrong, but is how it is. It's a, uh, again based on the uh, technicalities, the techno technological uh, advancement, development. Uh, this leads to lack of analytical process, which again, I would say, is uh, uh, dangerous. Then the robot teaching. Uh, we have more and more uh, promoted as a major development in the industry, uh, substituting the lectures uh, with uh, uh, pre-recorded video classes. And the idea is that we cut costs on this, and on the other side, uh, you know, we, we offer identical quality to all uh, of the guys. And of course, robot assessment of the things, which is uh, equally wrong from my point uh, uh, of view, although, uh, of course, it has uh, positive sides. Again, we cut efforts, uh, uh, personal efforts from the lectures, uh, time, uh, we, we reduce the things. Uh, if we take the, the, the things at large, what's happening in the world, in the economy, uh, we have uh, ideas about raising the job numbers. Uh, President-elect Trump uh, is talking about this uh, every single day, several times. And all over the globe, this is the, the gossip. But on the other side, uh, because of the technologies again, we see reduction of the full-time employment uh, while quite many new jobs are part-time. Uh, if we take it statistically, what's happening with uh, the most important part of the society, the middle class, again, we see this is America, but uh, it is not happening only in America. Imagine we have 20% uh, minus uh, in the middle class in America. If we say that uh, what happens in America comes to us as a tsunami, a few years later, imagine uh, the things. And then uh, in, if we take the main, main avenues again, what we can easily predict, it's going to happen, repetitive jobs will disappear. This sounds good from the point of view of paying salaries, but on the other side, imagine, Andrew was talking about that, many people yesterday talked about that, uh, if we get less people employed, we get social problems and economic problems, which we have to face. Then, the uh, jobs in the future, Michio Kaku says, uh, will be about what robots cannot do. Uh, the people will, who engage in somewhat intellectual work will get jobs and develop well. What about the rest? The rest will be like in the communism. You only lay down and uh, the food comes to your mouth uh, from above. Uh, then uh, a significant problem, which is again a mainstream thing, this is the Generation Y. Uh, uh, some of the panelists here yesterday mentioned that uh, Generation Y are very good guys. They had good ethics, uh, understanding, and so forth. But on the other side, they have some characteristics uh, which uh, seem to be, to me, from my perspective, quite dangerous traits laziness, uh, let me not mention all of them. Uh, so pros and cons uh, for the education. The first thing, the robot teaching, which is substitute the lecture by video recorded teaching. I hate this. But this seems to be a main avenue of development and robot assessment then. So uh, the positives of uh, this mainstreams, two minutes, OK. Identical high quality. What we offer is identical all over the globe to all students. Uh, significant cutoffs of uh, the, the costs of education, which pleases us. But is this the, the most important thing? And then unlimited in uh, geography, time and geography. Uh, what do we do? Uh, uh, Natashka asked me to, to say what we do in Bulgaria. Uh, we do intensively uh, online education. What does it mean? I have an MBA class. We have the class in room. Uh, and we apply a similar technology which Andrew Wilson just uh, mentioned there. Uh, some of the students who cannot attend the class, they participate in the class there. Uh, and they participate exactly in that way. We, I see them. The class sees them. They see the class in me. And they participate in the discussions. This is not robot education. This is technology-driven thing 
but it is not robot made. Then uh, uh, we have this professional video conferencing again, which allows us to teach uh, in two campuses simultaneously, online again. Negatives, fields of study where, one minute, uh, uh, where uh, the process of social interaction matters will suffer. Uh, the results depend on small number of, number of academic staff. This is uh, what we do in the academia is not one seed, one plant thing. So you, you pump up money and efforts in the academia, but the results are sometimes uh, quite less compared to what you expect. And the student satisfaction depends on the cultural uh, characteristics. In some countries it goes very well, in some countries it's uh, uh, d just bad. Uh, to cut off, uh, the technology develops much faster compared to what we do in the academia. We are much slower and still we have to adapt or otherwise we'll, get all, we'll have all sorts of uh, trouble. And uh, I'll end up with Albert, uh, Albert Einstein, who said, uh, I'm afraid of the day when the technologies will prevail over humanity. Then there will be generations of idiots in the world. We've got to do it in a way to stop this. Uh, with all the technological developments, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veselin. Спасибо огромное. Вложился. And now, thank you very much, also from my side, now I will give the floor to Alice Guillon, the Dean of Schema Business School from France. They have, um, uh, they have their uh, uh, school in Paris, in uh, uh, Sophie Anatopoulos, uh, Anat yeah. Ana Ana Anatopoulos. Anatopoulos. Yeah. Lille, Lille and Nice. Antipolis. And nice. Antipolis. 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 Antipolis, I knew that Sophie I would say it wrong. Uh... And Lille and Nice. So, yeah. good enough. <laughs> Welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will do my best to do less than 10 minutes. So, uh, first of all, it's um, uh, just at, at first glance how we could define this dynamic society. I know that you already did it. But for me, in, in our point of view, dynamic society, this is the characterization of knowledge economy. And uh, knowledge economy, this is the economy where talents, competencies, knowledge and skills are the strategic assets. Um, Firstly, I would like to say that this knowledge economy is totally globalized, but very more recently education was globalized. It means that we, we can say that it started 30 years ago, as the others started for uh, 50 or, or more. And it means that we are very young in this process of, uh, of globalization. So globalization is mainly characterized in education by some items, internationalization, languages, uh, expertise differentiation, students exchange, which is the base of internationalization of our business school, uh, but uh, really if we uh, follow the trends, we are not in business school totally globalized today. If I follow what Peter Lorange said a few years ago, he said a business school is globalized when it is present with its brand in different continents. Today we are mainly doing exchange students, we export our program, but we are not uh, on Probably we are only less than 2% to be really, to have set up really campus in the other continent. So it means that we have some job to do and uh, we have to, to work mainly under the auspice of the accreditation bodies just to standardize our quality. But uh, it means that we have some work to do. So education is, is uh, dynamic society is very important as you can see in this slide, but it means that uh, following what Eric Cornwell said yesterday, we have to re invent our model. We have to probably, it's time to reinvent our mission and to uh, discuss with our stakeholders to be certain to define our mission and to do a compromise between students' expectation, uh, um, companies' aspiration, and of course our government. I fully agree with what uh, was said uh, before in this panel. So it means that um, we are in this process, so this is a very positive point because re regarding what was said before here in this Forum, we, we can say that everybody is asking and uh, is uh, thinking about this new model. 
for sure. We had a chance seven years ago to start from a white page, creating a new school, Schema Business School, and we had a chance to ask more than 100 students about their aspirations. So the, the result of that is that students, when they are moving and when they are choosing a business school, they are choosing, of course, a brand, a project, uh, a, a territories where they want to study, uh, they, 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 they want to, to, uh, to discover a new culture, new project, but at least yeah. they want to find a job and they want to start their career and mainly in the international arena. And in the same way, we did, we did the same with, the, with companies and they're asking a lot of companies about their expectation regarding the creation of a new business school. They ask us, you see, what is important for us is to go beyond the management. We want to have ethic manager for sure. Business is business, but it has to be ethic. We want to have people who, who are able to innovate. We want to have people who can lead a virtual team and who can be at ease in a multicultural environment. So it's why when we decided to create this school, we created this school with a total innovation in the product, in the process, and of, sure, uh, of course with a new form. So it means that we have to think, and it could be a, 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 dr a, a, a driven force for us, we have to think about our structure, our content, and of course what we can do with our program. So we can do a lot of things. We can we can combine different products, uh, hybridization, on tech, online, of course, program carousel. We can combine also different structure, uh, different structure uh, with new branch, with a program develop outside, with multi-site and multi-channel uh, structure. So when we created Schema, School of Knowledge, Economy and Management, we started by Oh, sorry, but my slides are not in the, in the good set. So we started with, um, with um, asking the environment. So the environment in higher education is driven by three main forces, digitalization, R&D innovation, and of course, education. And the organization, they are doing, uh, they are looking for a new forms, of course, and new content. Uh, for sure, globalization means also uh, the revitalization of different territories. Uh, when we are. So it means that the cultural aspect is very important when we are talking about, about globalization. So we had a chance to create uh, this new structure uh, with, uh, based on three main things, mobility. So it's why we have these three campus, Danisa in France, but we have a, 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 a real campus in Suzhou in China, uh, and we are acting la, uh, as a, a Chinese uh, Player. We have a campus in the U.S. and we are acting as a, a U.S. Uh, business school and we have just opened a new campus in Brazil, in Belo Horizonte, and we are acting as a local uh, player there. So it means that our students, they can choose to be mobile all over the world. They can choose a pathway where innovation is very important because we have studied our campuses in techno parks and for sure knowledge management is very important and to go beyond uh, the management in our course. So this is a real new experience. This is fascinating. I can share that with you if you want and I hope that it was less than 10 minutes. So thank you very much for listening. Oh, it was six minutes. Thank you. <laughs> it's really <Thank> you. <laughs> fantastic time at six minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, now uh, I uh, have the duty. Now I am going to introduce the next uh, panelist, uh, Sergei Serebrnikov, who is the uh, Dean of Engineering Department uh, at uh, RENEPA. Thank you, Natalia. I am going to speak Russian. I am going to talk about uh, things that may seem obvious, and I may uh, repeat some ideas that other panelists have already voiced earlier. Uh, I have listened uh, to all presentations very carefully, and uh, as I did, I realized that in my presentation, I have not covered even a small part of what others uh, have uh, been able uh, to uh, touch upon today. Um, I would like to start by saying two things uh, that uh, not everyone will agree with. One, 
uh, we live in the world uh, where Humboldt's uh, learning model is uh, no longer relevant. There is a strong need uh, to develop a new approach uh, to education. Uh, today, many people talked about uh, learning technologies uh, that uh, uh, various uh, education centers all over the world are using today. Uh, and my second point uh, that I want to offer to you is that the need uh, for uh, pure managerial skills for managers or economists, uh, for people with narrow skills, uh, is no longer there. Nobody wants a narrow specialist. Uh, this is a fact. And uh, it uh, brings me to say that uh, within the process of Eurasian integration or within a broader uh, dynamic society uh, context, uh, don't worry about the presentation, it's OK, forget it. Uh, they tried uh, to open my uh, PowerPoint presentation, but failed. Uh, anyhow, uh, we know that uh, quick uh, changes uh, that we see in society bring about a situation uh, when uh, organizations uh, fail uh, to develop long-term strategies. Uh, people cannot uh, create plans for five years simply because uh, black uh, swans uh, can uh, change uh, things very quickly and we end up in a situation when we don't know where to go and what to do. This, again, has to do with uh, business education, and this is relevant uh, to uh, business education. Uh, the uh, tools that we use to make decisions are different in different geographies. Yes, indeed, uh, we often uh, fail to understand the way people make decisions uh, in uh, America. Uh, so we have to look for our own models and methods. We are uh, learning uh, Eastern experience. Uh, we look at what people do in Asia, and not all uh, Asian models are applicable uh, to Russia. There is no universal language uh, in this domain. Yet another point uh, that I want to take across uh, we have analyzed uh, many different requirements uh, that uh, businesses uh, set forth uh, for uh, job candidates. Uh, we uh, have uh, looked at uh, companies' expectations uh, for their employees, and we uh, see that there is a strong bias uh, towards uh, engineering, technical skills. Uh, today, uh, many people uh, mentioned uh, digitalization uh, process uh, in the uh, learning uh, systems. Uh, this means that uh, educators, uh, professors, need to have new skills. Uh, we are using uh, a lot of equipment. Uh, we're losing, we're using a lot of technologies. Uh, look, they could not even launch my PowerPoint presentation. They don't have the skills for that. Uh, this is an example. We uh, have an interesting situation. Uh, we are talking about knowledge economy. In the past, uh, technologies were determined by knowledge. Uh, today, uh, technologies create knowledge, and uh, knowledge uh, helps to enhance technologies um, in um, student communities, uh, in uh, business schools uh, for uh, advanced uh, learners. Uh, we have to offer people a good sets of skills and a high level of uh, technological knowledge. I am now uh, coming to the final part uh, of my uh, comments, and uh, let me say this. We uh, see that the gap uh, between uh, lower level uh, specialists and managers is uh, getting more narrow. 
the uh, technology uh, development uh, is such that managers uh, are really capable of understanding what is going on uh, at all levels of an organization. And uh, a uh, worker, uh, an operator of a machine tool also has to know uh, how his or her work uh, impacts uh, the whole organization. Uh, he or she should know uh, whether his work is competitive. Uh, a worker should uh, know uh, what alternative technologies can be used uh, to produce the same product. So the key task uh, for business schools uh, for the decades to come is to put together a new uh, curricula uh, that would uh, bring together uh, hard skills and uh, soft skills. And it's also very important uh, that uh, schools uh, give uh, their students uh, not only managerial skills, but also engineering technical skills. Uh, this uh, convergence uh, would be what businesses uh, would need in the future. Engineering language is universal, and it can help uh, all of us uh, to speak the same language that we will all understand, the language of knowledge. And it doesn't matter where that knowledge is produced, in China, in India, in Europe, uh, in the Ukraine, in Russia, uh, or in the US. Uh, it's uh, exactly what can bring us all together. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sergei. Quite interesting. This panel, and then prepare yourself, because we have a lot of time for discussion. And we shall invite you here up so that you get a microphone and you can really be translated if it's necessary and contribute. So now I would like to give the floor to Sam Potelikio. He is not here on this list. He comes from RANEPA, professor at RANEPA, and from Georgetown University, Washington. So, professor, you have a floor. Thank you so much. I need to thank my friend from Lithuania for calling the United States mature. We haven't been called mature, I think, for the last 12 months of this election debacle that we currently went through. And I want to link uh, the comments of Donitsa and, and Justin together. Where were we last year? Where are we now? And how might business school practice in the United States eventually make its way throughout the globe? And to do that, I thought what I would do is to relive uh, some nightmares and talk about the election that we went through. And why the president was able to become the president. I want to talk about three things. First, if you look at voters' opinion on why they chose Mr. Trump, if voters thought that the most important issue was the right experience, Hillary Clinton was the victor by 82 percentage points. If they thought that they wanted somebody who had good judgment, Hillary Clinton was the victor by 40 percentage points. And if they wanted somebody who cared about issues that were close to them, Hillary Clinton was the victor by 23 points. So then you ask yourself, well, how does Donald Trump win? He wins for voters who wanted change. And he wins that by 70 percentage points. And I think that this is something that we need to take into account when we talk about dynamic societies and constant flux and constant movement. The second point that I want to talk about is education as the new cultural divide. In my country, about 10% of people have a master's degree or higher. That is the average. And there are 18 states in the United States where more than 10% of the individuals in that state have a master's degree. For instance, I live in Washington, D.C. 28% of the residents of Washington, D.C. have a postgraduate degree. When I was a student at Harvard in Massachusetts, 18% of residents in Massachusetts have a master's degree. And now my birthplace of Maryland, 16% of master's degree. Of those 18 states that had more than 10% with the postgraduate degree, Hillary Clinton won all 18 of them that the number one predicted variable when you look at this electoral development is that if you look at the higher education accomplishments, you could almost certainly predict what candidate would be preferred. The third variable that is important 
is the elite gatekeepers. Historically, Republicans have won about 60% of the elite newspaper endorsements. This last election cycle, Donald Trump only won 3% of the elite endorsements. And yet, it seemed not to have an impact. And the reason why is the trust in institutions has completely dipped that the people in the United States used to have a great deal of trust in the elite media, 61% about 20 years ago, and that number is down to just 20%. Second thing that I want to talk about that I think is important for how we start to think about business education going forth is what will happen now to the global institutional architecture with America turning inward. If you look at these statistics here, it's America first. In fact, this was a tagline of President-elect Trump's campaign. And what impact this will have when it comes to increasing political scrutiny of the World Bank, of the United Nations, and other multilateral organizations. But most importantly, the rise of megacities and the decline of states with the rise of city states, whether or not it's Mumbai or Tehran or Lagos, and the importance of megacities when it comes to global finance, whether or not it's an important city like Moscow, where 40% of the GDP is produced here, and this being a predictive variable going forward. Leading to my final point, if you can't read the caption here, this is an airline passenger who raises his hand and says, these smug pilots have lost touch with regular passengers like us. Who thinks I should fly the plane? And as you can see here, he has some success in trying to rally the everyday passenger to now become the person who is in charge of this flight. That we may be entering a period where populism is the new normal, where we have skepticism towards big business, where we rethink our attachments to globalization, and where we have systematic reforms about the way we do things. But the reason why I wanted to bring this up, particularly with this session, is how it might impact the way that we train our future leaders of business, of politics, of nonprofit. I see here one of my fine students uh, from Renepa. She knows the answer to this question. But this, I think, is the most important question that I always pose to rising public leaders. Can you add a single line to this following equation to make it correct? There's just one rule here. When you add the single line to this equation to make it correct, you can't draw the single line through the equal sign to basically say you can't solve this equation. Just want you to take 20 seconds to see if you can solve this equation. If anybody is brave enough to volunteer an answer, I will collect that. Now watch closely. Do not feel embarrassed. I have given this question to 10,000 top leaders from around the world, and only four have gotten the correct answer. All four of the people who have gotten this correct answer were teenagers. And they were teenagers who came from what I call split families either different religions of mother and father or different nationalities. Uh, in fact, uh, a close colleague of mine, Professor Masayedov, is here, one of the top experts on intercultural communication. This is one of my arguments for trying to deal with this new dynamic situation that we have, is that the gap now might be between the elite and those that are not considered elite, and that we have these bubbles where we talk to each other, and yet we don't necessarily understand that the people still have power to inform the future of business, the future of politics. Here is the correct answer. As you can see, let me do it again. The, the audible gasp was not loud enough in this room. 10 to 11 equals 1050, that it's a combination of both words and numbers, that you have to think outside of boundaries. You have to get outside of your own brain. I typically will ask managers, I want you to visualize Anna approaching the bank 
In English, bank has four different meanings. So many people that may come from a major city like Moscow would envision Sparbank. Anna is approaching towards a financial bank. But people in Cairo might be visualizing Anna approaching the bank of the Nile River. And people in the hills of Lebanon might be thinking Anna approaching the snow bank. And if you're in Jordan, it might be the dirt bank. That we need to find a way in the 21st century to understand the real root of education, which in Latin means to get outside of. And my argument is that if we want to get outside of our own bubbles with this new divided society that we see, not just in the United States, not just in the Western Europe, but in the divisions between cities and those outside of these mega centers, we need to be able to get outside of our own perspective and be purposely provoked. Whether or not it's a combination of learning policy if you're a business manager or business if you're a policymaker, we need to have more flux when it comes to our educational practices. Thank you. Thank you very much. So look, we are fantastically in time. Uh, I am not intending to make a, sum a summary of these uh, rich presentations. I shall just share with you what st will stay and what I shall take with me from this panel. And that is that we were really taking, uh, uh, giving a, paying a big attention to intercultural exchange to ability to appreciate other cultures, and we are planning, uh, we are thinking that with the Silk Road activities and with connecting the continents and countries, we could do a lot more with students. I have to say that I'm very much appreciative of uh, what Azilbek Kozhehmetov from Alma U uh, was uh, trying to do and made successful, in fact. And this was like giving a vision to what we should do. Uh, you know, to, about to make it more solid, these uh, ideas, to realize these projects, like joint projects, scientific base to give to all this. I think that this was uh, a great contribution. I appreciate, of course, very much the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the contributions on multicultural teams and on all that. Uh, I would like to say uh, that uh, uh, Veselin was talking about millennials, millennials, you know, the young generations, and I would like to uh, here to share with you that in our school, uh, one of the students had a PhD about millennials, uh, his thesis, PhD thesis, and the final, uh, with a mentor from, I think, Harvard University from somewhere outside, from a very important uh, management uh, development institution, and he came to conclusion that millennials, the talk about millennials is a construct. That in fact there is nothing like millennials. And uh, when you said, Veselin, that they are lazy, it doesn't mean lazy. They just, it's kind of typical for them is that they want to develop very quickly, uh, not waiting for career, you know, steps, etc., but going straight for it. And they don't want to work day and night like uh, our generation is doing. But in any case, his conclusion was that this is a construct, just to, you know, and he made a very serious work about that. I like very much also, of course, outside of the box thinking. And of course, we were talking a lot about the role of technology, which I think we need both, as I mentioned in the beginning, high tech and high touch. High tech to transfer the knowledge and to help us, you know, to connect and to bring the best from the West, as I always say, and leave the rest. But uh, also, we need also, and very much for complex situation, the high touch, where creativity, reflection, you know, facilitation of all this, uh, it's very, very important. And, um, uh, and uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, I was um, some months ago at, in Shanghai, in, uh, in Shanghai, at the uh, Antai College, where they made a <clears throat> in very interesting and high-quality conference on management, um, education, and so on. And there, uh, we were. Uh, I was. Uh, I was uh, very happy to hear a presenter from USA. I think it was from Michigan University, who was telling us how. Uh, management education is getting some new uh, obligations, like in the courses for the bu uh, for businesses, uh, you have to start to educate their managers uh, to share with them all the literature, 
so that the, the professor from management school is not only teaching but also sharing the knowledge and leaving all the materials at the end so that they can cascade, as they said, the knowledge inside of the company. And since this happened just to me with the Swiss pharmaceutical company, just in that period and before the new year, I had a workshop with this company for two days where they explained me what we have to do for them and that we have to leave all the knowledge, in fact, there. It was a terribly important uh, preparation. So if I help you with this, you know, to, to the ones who are not aware of that yet, uh, I think I did something useful because uh, when I heard it for the first time, I was shocked. But then I saw that this is possible. But then you have to prepare these people and they, you know, these managers there, but they still continue to need you because nobody can with a little, you know, with literature and with a little course do the same. But they can distribute the information. So uh, uh, I, I would like uh, with this open the floor and uh, thanking all the panelists for your very rich uh, contributions. I hope that RANEPA and all the organization here, I saw Sergei coming, you will use this from all these panels to publish because this uh, forum is really a, an extraordinary forum and I think we, you could contribute a lot to the world of management education if you publish that and uh, distribute it widely around the world so that, you know, in the form of booklet uh, or on, on website or whatever, so that we can all profit from that. So uh, thank you ahead. And now we were talking mm -hmm. with Natalia yes. that we suggest that everybody is uh, perhaps yeah. using, yeah? We, the, yeah. Can, yes, See? of course. We, have we want, colleagues, we have time. We had planned in, in, uh, in that way together with the panelists to um, have some more time at the end of uh, the session for discussion. Because it's very important to be interactive here. So we saved some time for open discussion to give the floor to you in the audience if you want to share anything uh, about the subject matter of this conference or ask questions. What I want to uh, the way I wanted to do, please come up to this table and speak into the microphone rather than <coughs> speak uh, from your seat. I'm happiness director at Games of Future. It's an NGO. Uh, we do breakthrough educational technologies. And I've got uh, a question about uh, technologies at business schools because uh, as a person from non-commercial sector, I expect business schools to be on the cutting edge of uh, education. Uh, so, uh, do you have anything uh, about project learning? I mean, not just case study, but uh, when you send uh, students to do real project with uh, real businesses, uh, what do you do about uh, social and uh, emotional learning? Uh, and uh, if we say about the challenges uh, which are today uh, in our world, uh, it's uh, one of the main challenges is that competition goes from technology to managerial systems, uh, all the things about uh, agile, uh, about till paradigm, and so on. Uh, so what do business schools do to uh, help businesses shift their culture from uh, vertical culture to a horizontal culture, uh, which enables uh, till models and something like this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. The Is colleagues who would like to answer, who would like to answer? I can yes, make yes, a note yes. On yes. If you don't mind. Yeah. I can make a note on the second question which you mentioned. It's very much culture based. Uh, Dow Quot, uh, the previous CEO of Heineken, uh, who uh, delivered a speech uh, to the Seaman Conference uh, some 10 years ago, he said exactly, I'm almost quoting, he said, in all history of uh, organizing, developing joint ventures between uh, Holland, pay by general and France, there is no one successful case. Always it fails because the understanding of how the management has to go in the French uh, society is totally different from the Dutch society. In the Dutch area, you want a, a participation of everybody there, consensus reached and so forth. In France, you want the boss to say what it has to be how it has to be done, 
and then you can organize La Bastille, for example. You know, you can protest after that, but you obey. Totally different business approaches based on the cultural uh, values, things like that. But of course, it's only a, a point of view. I don't uh, claim that it has to be uh, universal. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we are, each of us has a, its own, ex, his or her own experience, so we shall try to answer. Please. I think that um, I mentioned a little bit in my opening remarks. It's very important to have the right attitude to be able to appreciate country with different culture, people with different values. But I understand all the countries or all the culture also share something in common. They want to be successful. They want to achieve prosperity. And I think that with this kind of common foundation for working together, as long as you have ability to appreciate the others, then I think that people can work as a team. And uh, one of very successful banks that developed in Asia is HSBC. Yes. And I think that this bank now is a global bank. And I think that they have a very good motto. That is to think globally, but to act locally. I think that this combination is a way to deal with the cultural differences. Certainly, to think globally means that the companies want to grow. The company want to you know, explore the opportunity that arise in different countries, in different societies. But to be successful, you need to work, you need to function locally, and to respect country with different culture, and uh, to help the country with different culture to be successful, and uh, to you know, trust the colleagues that you employ locally, and uh, give them the authority to be successful locally. So that might be the way to solve the you know, challenges of working in a multicultural environment in this global world. Thank you. Also, Virginius had something to add? Yes, I would like to share uh, my experiences of Odysseus Graduate School. Uh, we, we are a bit uh, different school, a specific school, because we are not working with undergraduates. We are already working with the people who are in business or, let's say, in activities. So that's a little bit more easy because every student, they are working in parallel with the teaching process. We are working on the project it's, uh, already on their own organization. So uh, in addition to knowledge and skills, how to understand, how to analyze the company, how to analyze people in the company, how to build the teams, uh, different kind of, uh, based on the different style and understanding, etc. So they are working that and doing that, implementing in their own organizations themselves and we are guiding them through that process. So when they are coming, they are, they are discussing with us, you know, where they failed, you know, how they did that transformation, how they uh, analyzed where on which stage of the organizational life cycle of the organization is, how to build the necessary team, how to build the structure, how to build the strategy for that organization. So it's a project itself. It's a lot of emotional competence development because you nearly need to build the right team for the particular stage and put the right people in the, uh, to, in order to make the right uh, decisions and also to implement these decisions in the proper way. So it's a definitely project-based, but it's more easy to do that with the experienced people who already, you don't need to explain what the problems are in the business, but we are helping them how to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I, uh, I would like to add that here in front of us is sitting the dean of Estonian Business School, and Seaman had last year just with the wish to help to our members to uh, start to be aware more of the use of technology, we went to Estonia to have the annual conference there. Uh, and it was something really, uh, you know, f uh, for thinking out of the box and for uh, s uh, seeing what are the opportunities. If you would like to say something, how you do that there, and how are you as a school you know, using this uh, knowledge would be very, very interesting. Um, 
Hello, my name is Thomas. I'm uh, from Estonian Business School. I probably would not go so much in uh, digital uh, issues, but I'm more sticking actually the topic of uh, when we're talking about one belt, one road, actually, and what this uh, was uh, proposing by uh, Danitsa, actually, is that the question uh, uh, how we uh, collaborate actually with uh, along this uh, uh, Asian Eurasian uh, cooperation. And uh, well, the, there is the kind of two points where we start from. One thing is the question how to bring the special knowledge for the students. And we, when we look at the, what are the professional skills we're missing today is actually teamwork, leadership, uh, cross-cultural understanding, etc. And uh, we have two experiences. One experience, we have got a negative answer from One Belt, One Room Foundation, and one, uh, one project is going on, uh, will be boot started with a boot camp uh, next week with a global company in Beijing. And actually what we do, we, there's a technology in place. Technology is something that connects to two parts of the world, Estonia and uh, China. Students from Estonia and China, we're going to work 10 weeks running a real a business project for the global company uh, headquartered in Beijing. It's a Western company. We have teams of Estonians. We have teams of, uh, uh, of for people from Hong Kong, and we mix them. They meet once a uh, week before they have final presentation to the board. Meanwhile, they have to work remotely. Distance learning, working in the future, working in distance is so common. The question, how can we cope that? If you first time meet these things when you graduate, you probably will be shocked or nervous. When you allow them to do that during the 10 weeks, they know what it means. They know what it, the business community expects. And that's, that's one angle, working with the cultures in distance. And then the question is that, how can we get interdisciplinary learning? Because, and I think it was Andrew or someone else yesterday said that, we need to look at indifferences, not the similarities of the business school. Let's find a business school who does exactly the same and let's work in the same team. Not much learning beside the culture. But what we have said from Hong Kong Polytechnic University, okay, they will give us engineers, we have the business students, and they have to cope in 10 weeks. They have team conflicts. They have to solve that. We coach them, both sides. And the multinational will mentor them. Uh, and this is going to happen in the future, and we, the reason why we do that is to provide real-life practical learning. It's not part of the curricula. curriculum. It's extracurricular. And one of the challenges we run there, I think technology is not a challenge. There are two challenges we face it. Is one thing, a student's ambition. If we think that everybody wants and runs for that uh, teamwork, no. They are quite in comfort zone. Student uh, currency is a credit point. We said we don't give any credits because we get wrong students in the team then. We want the students have the, we have the will. And, and, uh, and that's, that is something on ambition level. And another challenge, uh, what we have uh, is uh, actually if we look at the impact side, if we look at the one belt, one road issue, then uh, we need to get away from the between university uh, collaboration between the programs but we need to get an impact on one bend, one road issue. We had a one project idea between universities, we got a negative answer, and the main challenge there was to set impact. Where it has happened, what is going to happen, this, what the result is. And uh, today we should try to make it happen as a based on kind of the multinational, see the impact is larger and larger. But really this is one of the big issues if we build the connection with the One Belt, One Road initiative, there is the biggest issue is the really challenge is how can we make an impact? And, and impact is, I think, universities, despite the uh, cooperation between the countries, universities always can find very positive connections. And now we have to define the rule of how we can facilitate actually the businesses or especially societies, municipalities actually. How can we help them to get together? And, and this is something is uh, uh, really important. And uh, with interdisciplinary, of course, this, uh, as I said, working, learning in distance, I think learning in distance is also not, I believe it's not a big issue. But really, I thought that kind of uh, uh, ambitious level of the students is one of the challenges, actually, as well, to cope with together.
to get that. And at the university level, of course, the question is, how can we make an impact if two universities work together? We said, okay, let's build a methodology, for example, that Hong Kong has started. They asked us, and now we build a methodology how to build, bring the chemification into the teaching social science and subjects. How to make the teaching and studying very attractive on both sides. And technology is really based on that. And this is something we try to take a Estonian part, uh, the knowledge, what we have in the digital learning and the e-government e side, into this uh, education. And from the other side, we get kind of the environment where we can really implement that kind of things. And what's happening, actually, that really we're prospecting with differences, but we're really seeking kind of common ground, actually, what we do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a, quite a contribution, but uh, deserved. Uh, since we were talking about uh, technology, I would just like to add that I uh, like very much this word, the impact. And in my school, we try to build the impact through art. You know, we are realizing that people, and, and with experiential learning, we made a school, so about dif how to differentiate yourself. And we, we made out of the school the art gallery. Uh, we are, uh, the Bled as a place, it's already a very reflective place. We are uh, really focusing on search of meaning. So we have more and more businesses from all over the world who come and have, in fact, a kind of retreat, you know, where they are talking about identity. Companies are losing identity by merging, etc. So uh, we are bringing people, we are bringing them to the country if they have a topic identity, like Bosnia, where they have a problem with identity. We bring together the politicians, you know, we have we, we, business leaders, art leaders, etc. And then we have very intimate conversations about the meaning, etc. with two people, two managers, with one manager in that country, where, uh, you know, where they find the meaning for the work they do, etc. So this is just one example, and I'm sure that each of us here in this room have some examples. But I was, uh, I see, you know, that this had, had a very important role. We have in our MBA eight days on art and leadership. What, how can you learn from music to become a better listener? How can you learn from visual arts to become a better observer, etc.? So if you want to develop in a manager who is paying attention to these aspects, then you come to us. If you are a manager who would like to have more on IT and on other things, then you come to Ranepa, because here you have uh, the colleague, you know, uh, Rijov Alexander, who also made in our school an MBA, but he has two doctoral degrees, you know. Then, if you want to see how to use the big data, et cetera, in marketing and el anywhere else, then you come here. So everybody should know what you need. And I think that we in management schools, and I'm sure that we all agree about that, we need much more to know about the company and about the people we receive in the school. We have to have serious, I had this, uh, before New Year, two days in pharmaceutical company in Switzerland, two days workshop where eight people were two days explaining me who are they and what they need. And so I went home and then I start to understand that in fact, if I want to offer them something, I have to start to work very seriously, you know, and to go back with my question, etc., that I shall make something appropriate for them. You know, this is, the management education is changing, is becoming much more advising, consulting, much more than just teaching, you know. That is what we have to start really to work on to change. Спасибо, Даница. Коллеги, кто еще готов или выступить, задать вопрос? Спасибо, Даница. Anybody else ready, else ready to speak? I have a question for you. Uh, let me introduce myself. Eugene Mikhailenko, PhD in law, uh, System Management Association, the chairman. Uh, which language should I prefer to ask the question, Russian it's or okay. English? It's, it's English? Okay, let me ask English in Russian okay, then. No okay. Colleagues, every side, every medal has two sides. And we're happy 
that the uh, education becoming more affordable, including by the use of new technology, the internet, etc. But the negative side of it is this. Quite often we are aware that the quality of education deteriorates as a result. Business education, economic education, legal education, well, that is more or less okay. But medical, the quality, uh, poor quality of medical education, that is really dangerous. So my question is this, dear colleagues, what do you think? How can we prevent the deterioration of the quality of education through or this way to make it more affordable, accessible? The traditional education was built on personal contact between the teacher and the student. Now, quite often they don't even see each other and nobody knows what kind of uh, uh, tasks a person performed, uh, did he perform those tasks uh, or use the internet. We don't know about that. I would, would not give you specific na names of schools which do things like that. That was on Russian TV. So the question is uh, this, how to prevent uh, the uh, dilution of quality through remote learning? It's an interesting question, of course. Well, in uh, Rabo and Nasdorb, uh, our organizations are going to have an open session of the presidium after the session. These are the issues which are extremely high on our agenda. We are responsible for the quality of business education in Russia and Nasdorb. Uh, which uh, are, uh, is doing accreditation of the schools and programs. Being so, we do exert a lot of effort to make sure we maintain high qualities, high quality of ed, uh, education. We monitor those standards. And the uh, 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 organizations which have accreditation from Mas Dober, we do monitor that. Now, how can that be done generally, or what else can be done? You cannot do that. You can do nothing about that, because there's the market. The market will decide. Before, you would uh, have a graduate from a government university with a government diploma. There had been no guarantee, any guarantee, that that would be a high-level professional, and that Unfortunately, now the situation, especially in our country, I don't know about what happens in your colleagues, in your country's colleagues. Uh, in our country, I would not give you percentage points. Roughly 60% of graduates from uh, institutions do not take jobs in their specialty. There is statistics to confirm that. Unfortunately, New universities, business schools, and let's put things straight. Some, some of those simply sell their diplomas, do not require their students to do anything. What can be done about that is to know about it, to try to manage that process, to make sure that our institutions, maybe business schools, who do their work properly, properly, even if it's remote learning, to allow them to raise their level of quality for us to be responsible for that level. And, but the trash will be there. I, of course, agree that not everybody sells diplomas or learning certificates. But those who do that, they are quite numerous. And for an employer, they wouldn't know what is the quality of a, a diploma uh, from a particular business school. Don't you think there should be a specific mechanism in addition to a state uh, uh, accreditation that would guarantee the quality of education for employers to make sure employers see that the quality of learning was good? Uh, Yelena Zubkova. Uh, a former deputy director of Mirmi School. She's an international inspector of AMBA, 
and in particular in Nasdobr, she is responsible for the quality of education. Please don't think that employers don't know anything about the business schools. And that's important for them, what kind of business school person graduated from. Everybody knows about uh, top companies, you know, uh, well, top companies do know what business schools are all, all about. And as Natalia has said, the market would decide and to get an interesting and good job. Graduates of business schools have to be graduates from good business schools. The business schools who are recognized not only domestically but internationally as well and have proper accreditation. And additionally, today remote learning is being considered as an add-on, as something that uh, goes on top of good fundamental education that will stay with a person for the rest of their lives. And uh, this opportunity to get remote learning, online learning, this is simply uh, a possibility, uh, a person, an optional thing. And this LL life of learning becomes very important part uh, for, for a person who wants to develop their careers, who uh, would want to make sure that their paradigm of career development uh, goes on um, constantly upward. Uh, some people say uh, remote learning is no good because you cannot check. We can check because you take this learning for yourselves, right? You don't want to do something to harm yourselves in that. Young students starting uh, their university lives, these kids, you, uh, when they start learning in higher education, you need to train them how to learn, including remotely. University of London, uh, since 1856, they had uh, remote learning since then because Queen Victoria believed that the uh, citizens of the British Commonwealth, wherever they are, should have the same level of quality of education, and the same education, the same level of quality and education. That's why their system of remote learning had been developed very, very well. And an open university is another example of that. Uh, a student which enrolls in any program, the first book they should get in their first s set of books or manuals should be called a good study guide. We should train them how to learn. The students, graduates, etc. then they will get the most from what we try to give them. Then our efforts will not be wasted. Otherwise, we could be great teachers, we could talk about great things, but if a person cannot accept what we give them, the opportunities that we create them, for them, then it would be simply a waste, and the efforts would be wasted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Well, I, I believe it's a very, very broad issue here. And let me try to show you the whole perspective, the way I see it. First, <coughs> what I hear. Well, parents do not take that responsibility for the selection of a school. The companies don't take responsibility for the choice of the, uh, a business school. This is the opinion, but I do think that it's uh, something inherited from uh, Soviet past, where we thought that uh, uh, education was like a pub part of the public good. Well, when you select, select where teeth, your 
the teacher sorry, the theater you want to go you make a selection and try to do it properly but in education sometimes we forget to make the right uh, selection and to first become competent and then in the market economy i believe companies uh, responsibility for the high quality of education is extremely high and the quality good quality should be created together, not unilaterally by any of the parties. Once the companies start realizing that, starting sharing their responsibility, that would work better for the quality of business schools. Education as a service means it's not si simply a, a good that is given by the government, and the government would be responsible. No, we should all be responsible for the quality. Uh, we are a market economy, and we uh, should have the competitive environment, uh, open, uh, free, professional competition is important. Uh, there are uh, certain regulations, uh, some requirements. Let me uh, give you an example of Almaty uh, University that I work for. Uh, we um, have uh, had a spike uh, in uh, new open education. Uh, initially, we did not have connections with the business community. We didn't have the money. Today, we're the best university. Uh, we have 3,000 students, 500 MBA students. There's no doubt uh, that we have uh, had some achievements because of the market economy, not because uh, the government gave it to us. Uh, if the government uh, begins uh, to control, uh, we uh, stop uh, developing. Uh, through the market economy, uh, we see uh, bad businesses emerging too, but bad businesses, uh, dishonest companies, uh, should uh, just uh, die away, uh, but uh, through the market mechanisms, not uh, because the government uh, will push them away. Uh, thank you, Sir Beck. Uh, time is up, and uh, we are at the end of the uh, time slot that we have been given. I would like to say thank you to all panelists, uh, all those who uh, spoke today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we don't have any more time. Uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to Danica uh, for final remarks. Uh, the, the colleague uh, should really, uh, really fight for the quality and everybody else. You know, you, you cannot get, if you know that there is the case, you fight to dismiss the dean and et, et cetera. You know, you have to make change. So uh, perhaps this is a start of a very important change, you know. And I don't think, the only thing I don't agree with Azilbek is that this is in here in Russia. It's all over the world. You have bad and good. So, uh, you know, don't think that it's just in Russia, you know. So we have to work a lot. And I think that such a, what you mentioned, Natalia, Rabo, and Seaman, and AMBA, and all this, you know, not only accreditation agencies, because often they are too much sticking to certain rules and to certain, you know, uh, that, they elaborate it, uh, labor, that they elaborate and they are sometimes not, uh, re, uh, how shall I say, they cannot be, in fact, in front, you know, because they are following the practice, uh, although some they try to be. But I think that with such a meeting as ours today here, and I see that in this GUIDAR forum there are quite uh, a lot of sessions on education, we can contribute a little bit at least to the improvement, to sharing the new yeah, ideas, of course, of course. to this sharing the practices, etc. But this is the process, and uh, mm -hmm. I would like to consolate you, you know, that, that you are not the only one, but, that you, but to stimulate you at the same time that you do something for that, you know, also in your own environment, only on that way. And I think that we are really realizing more and more that business schools play an important role as educators, intermediators, and in business society platforms. So we have to be responsible for responsible management education. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, you for great to great public who was on time and who was contributing. Thank you. Thank you.